So what we're going to do today is we're going to um, basically go through various groups of organisms and, and groups of living things and talk just a, real briefly about it. I mean, you don't have to memorize all the details. You should be aware of sort of the general trends and be aware of um, sort of how things, how organisms evolved over time, but you don't need to know tons of the detail. All right. So those of you that are that like the blank copy i don't know i feel like i left too much out like there's going to be a lot to write down so i would say maybe for this section just rely on the, the hard copy because i don't want you to, there's there's a lot here to write down so you might as well just look at it because it's not super important that you like memorize the information we're talking about today i just want you to get the overview all right, so if we think back to classification, um, how, when we look at our, how we group things, um, the biggest level, the broadest level are the domains. How many domains were there? Does anyone remember that? All life is into one of how many domains? That's kingdoms. Okay, William said six, even less than that. Two. Close. Three. So all living things go in one of these three big, huge groups. Okay, those are called the domains. Like we're in the same domain as an oak tree or a mushroom or an amoeba. So obviously these are like really broad groups. You know, because you think, we're, well, we're not very closely related to an oak tree or an amoeba, and that's correct. But these are really big groups based on some characteristics. The groups are bacteria, then you have um, archaea, and then you have eukarya, and we'll talk about each of those. So bacteria, we're, we're pretty familiar with in terms of we know what they are. They are um, single-celled living organisms. We call them unicellular. The other term we talked about last time is this concept of the genetic material. Some groups evolved have their genetic material, their DNA is surrounded by a nuclear membrane and it's enclosed and held in there. Other organisms don't have that nuclear membrane. Their DNA is just kind of floating around in their cells. Bacteria are one of those where the, the, they don't have a nucleus. Their DNA is just floating around in the cytoplasm. The word for that is prokaryote, okay? Pro means before. These things evolved before a nucleus evolved. Bacteria's nutrition, some are autotrophs and can go through photosynthesis. Others are heterotrophs and have to consume other things. Like the bacteria that cause an infection in your throat or your ear, they're heterotrophic bacteria. They're consuming molecules in your throat or in your ear. It's, part, it's one of the reasons why they lead to you know, pain and, and inflammation, things like that. But there's also some bacteria uh, living in different areas, aquatic areas usually that can fo you do photosynthesis. Okay? So they can be either one. They also have a cell wall. It's made of a substance called peptidoglycan. Don't worry about it. Uh, they reproduce asexually. So they basically copy themselves. They split in half, copy their DNA, and form new organisms. They also can exchange genetic material. Two bacteria can actually go through this process called conjugation, where they exchange genetic material. And so that's a form of sexual reproduction as well. Examples of bacteria, streptococcus, that causes strep throat. Staphylococcus, that um, causes a staph infection. E. coli, blue-green algae, and these are listed in order. Staphylococcus, streptococcus, staphylococcus, E. coli, and blue-green algae. Now, what do you think about these blue-green algae as you look at them? Do you think looking at them can tell you something about them? Is 
Does their color give you any indication about anything? Yeah. Well, we just said they're autotrophs. Correct. We know that chlorophyll, the pigment that can absorb sunlight, is green. And these blue-green algae are green because they contain that to allow them for photosynthesis. Good book. So that's one big group. That bacteria group. Another big group, archaea. These are the weird things that we probably are not at all familiar with. Okay, they're all around, but we're just not familiar with them. They were only discovered relatively recently. They're also unicellular. They're also prokaryotes. They don't have a nucleus. Again, some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. So you may be saying like, well, why, are, why don't we just call these things bacteria? Right, they have these same characteristics, but when scientists look at them more more closely, originally they were lumped with bacteria, when scientists first discovered them, but then they started looking at them in more detail at molecular evidence, found they're actually not that closely related to bacteria. They have a cell wall also, but it's made of different material. They typically reproduce asexually, and at process when they split into it's called binary fission splitting into some of them are extremophiles they can live in extreme conditions places where scientists previously thought nothing could possibly survive super um hot areas super salty environments okay those are environments like in the geysers that uh, come up with boiling hot water and, and chemicals out of the ground, scientists thought nothing could survive there or in extremely salt, salty conditions. But when they look closely after they found these organisms, they find some of them can live there okay, in these very extreme environments. And then the last group, so three domains. Eukarya, bacteria, and now this one, eukarya. This is the one we're probably most familiar with. Oops. This includes um, things that do have a nucleus. So they're called eukaryotes. Their, their genetic material has a membrane around it, keeping it enclosed. There's four kingdoms within this. Protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. The kingdoms we're probably familiar with. Plants, animals, fungi, and the protists. And we'll get into some details. So let's let's talk about those. So protists. We looked at protists back in seventh grade. Do you guys remember looking at amoeba and paramecium in the microscope? If you're here, you probably did that. Um, those are tiny little single-celled organisms. They generally live in the water, they're aquatic. Okay. Most of them are unicellular. They're eukaryotes, they do have a nucleus. Some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. Depends on the type. Some are even both in one. Some like a euglena has chloroplast and can make its own food but it can also consume organisms for energy. So it can do either one. They can reproduce asexually or sexually. And protist is kind of like a kingdom. Like now when scientists that study classification look at protist, they're like, we should never have made this kingdom. It's just kind of where things that don't fit in the other groups, just kind of throw them in there in the protist kingdom. Is that is how that arrived? arose. So if scientists were redoing classification, they don't do that anymore. But that's kind of like the traditional kingdom of protista. Just put things that don't go anywhere else. Okay. So there's different types of protist. Um, and so they're, they're quite different from each other, some of those. The ones you um, probably have seen before, I have, like I said, in seventh grade, are some of these animal-like protists. They move around, you can see them. Uh, they're found in fresh water. Um, they can move around from place to place using different methods. 
different structures. Like this is an amoeba, okay? It moves by just blobbing its cytoplasm along and it kind of just oozes forward like a, like a blob. It sends forth these, its cytoplasm and they're called pseudopods, those sort of extensions of their cytoplasm. Some like this um, paramecium, they have tiny little hairs around the outside they use to swim around. They kind of paddle it around the water. That's called, called cilia. Others, um, like the euglena, have a tail, just one long whip-like tail that kind of spins around and, and propels it through the water. And so um, those things make up the protist kingdom. Also included here are a bunch of algae. These are like plants. So these protists were like animals, kind of. They move around. Many of them are consumers. These protists are more like plants, things like algae. Most of them don't move. They mostly have a cell wall. They're autotrophs. And, you know, they're things like the spirogyra, is a spirally sort of uh, protist. Kelp, these huge con um, collections of these uh, protists. Diatoms, these tiny little things that make like an exoskeleton. These you could actually find in toothpaste. They're putting toothpaste to make it a little more abrasive. So it like cleans your teeth. Okay. They have interesting shapes. And this is a volvox. So they're just kind of interesting to look at. They're mostly microscopic. Obviously not the kelp, which looks like a plant. Um, but many of them are microscopic. If you go to a pond around your neighborhood, collect some water and look in a microscope, you're probably going to find a bunch of these types of protists living in there. Fungi. I've been called a fungi, um, but fungi are mostly decomposers, okay? They are, are multicellular, mostly, things like a mushroom, okay? Uh, but some of them are unicellular, like yeast that we use in cooking or in uh, brewing beer and wine, things like that. That's a, a fungus as well. They're eukaryotes. What does that mean? Remind me of what that means. Eukaryote. Zoom people, you with me? What is a eukaryote? Silence. Mary's trying to avoid the question by drinking a cup of coffee. She thought I wasn't going to call on her. Anybody? What is a eukaryote versus a prokaryote? Come on, people. Oh. What? Nucleus? Has to do with the nucleus. William got us started. What does it mean? What about the nucleus? It has one? Correct. It has one. Here, I'll give you like a little hint. Eukaryotes do, you do have a nucleus. Pro have no nucleus. Pro rhymes with no, you rhymes with do. Prokaryote, pro, no nucleus. Eukaryote do have a nucleus. Fungi are heterotrophs, they're consumers. They have to break down organisms to obtain nutrients, to obtain energy. They have a cell wall. It's, again, it's made of a different material. It's not the same material that you find in a plant cell wall or a bacterial cell wall. Typically, fungi reproduce using spores. Um, spores are, are reproductive cells that when they land in an opportune area can start to grow. They're almost like tiny little seeds. Examples are things like mushrooms mold that grows like on bread or uh, the bathroom wall, mildew. Yeast is a fungus. That's appetizing before lunch. Mildew. 
I took this picture of Mr. Akiri's house. And yeast. Those are fungi. Plants, the plant kingdom. Multicellular, plants are made of many cells. They're eukaryotes. Somebody besides Will, tell me, what does it mean if they are eukaryotes besides Francesca? Hmm? Ah, looks like you are today, Will. Zoom, I want someone from Zoom answering this besides Francesca. Mary. It has a nu nucleus? Correct, it has a nucleus. Somebody else on Zoom. What the heck is a prokaryote? Not Francesca, not Mary. Flagellum thing? Not flagellum. Prokaryotes has again to do with the nucleus. Something about the nucleus. What is a prokaryote? Come on, give me something, Keegan, Reagan, Cameron, Francis. Anybody in that group. Pro rhymes with? No. No. Because they have no nucleus. nucleus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I might ask you that question again. Okay, plants are autotrophs. They make their own food using photosynthesis. They have chloroplasts, an organelle which allows them to do that. Plants have a cell wall also, but it's made of a different material, cellulose. Do plants reproduce sexually? They do. Pollen grains are really kind of like sperm cells to an animal. That's what pollen is. It's the male reproductive cell of a plant. See some, some looks there. Maybe you didn't realize that. And then what is the female parts are in the flower. That's the ovary of a flower has um, the female parts, has eggs in it. Just like a female animal ovary has eggs in it. So if you buy your friend a bouquet of flowers on their birthday, what you're really presenting them with is a bundle of reproductive organs from a plant. When you eat a piece of fruit, what you're really eating is the ripened mature ovaries of a plant. So just saying, sorry, Mary, you don't look very happy about that, but that's, that's true. It's biology. It's okay. Okay. There's different groups of plants. Um, we don't need to know the details. There are some plants that actually are called bryophytes. They don't really have roots or stems or leaves. This includes things like mosses. You know, they just kind of can grow on the surface of things. They can't grow very tall because they don't have tissue to move things around. They often grow in like shady environments. Um, they need to be in contact with, with moisture. The other plants that we're probably more familiar with are the ones that do have these, uh, this tissue to carry materials around inside of them. They have roots and stems and leaves. They have xylem and phloem, which carries things around the plant. So a fern, for example. Okay, or, you know what that flower is, anybody? What is that? No, those white flowers, you see them all over growing in like fields and parking lots. It's called Queen Anne's Lace. It's got little white flowers on the top. Scientific, scientific name, Daucus carota. Wild carrot, sometimes called. If you grab one of those things and you dig it out of the ground, there'll be a little root on the bottom. And if you look at it and smell it, it smells like a carrot. And you can actually eat them. So survival tip from Mr. Doros to you. If you're ever lost in the forest, find some Queen Anne's Lace can eat some of the roots. And trees. We're a little before this picture. But. And finally, that brings us to our final kingdom. Kingdom Animalia, the animal kingdom. 
The animal kingdom are made of organisms that are multicellular. So we are in here. So multicellular organisms made of many cells sort of all working together. Do animal cells have a nucleus? William says, yes, he's correct. What is the word for that? Who could give it to me? Not William, not Francesca. What is the word for organisms, not Mary, organisms that have a nucleus in their cells? Eukaryote? Correct, Jenna, thank you. A eukaryote, they do have a nucleus. How do animals get energy? Heterotrophic. They're heterotrophs. They have to eat things to get energy. You have to eat something to get energy. They do not have a cell wall. They reproduce mostly sexually, but some animals can reproduce asexually as well. Most of them move around, but there are some that don't. Here's the big groups of animals. We'll talk about them real quickly. Periphera, Nidarium, Platyalminthes, Nematoda, Mollusca, Annelida, Arthropoda, Echinodermata, Chordata. Those are the main groups. There's other groups scientists have identified, but we'll talk about that. So don't worry about any of these details. It's just interesting to talk about some of these things. So you don't have to worry about the details. Sponges, did you know sponges are animals? Does anyone have like one of these kind of sponges at home, like a natural, like a loofah sponge? No? Well, they're actually the remains of a dead animal. That's what those kinds of sponges are. That's sort of its almost skeleton it produces. Um, sponges are filter feeders. They get food by, they suck in water from the ocean and they filter out little bits of nutrients that are in that food. They don't have organs or tissues. They're very simple animals. They're the simplest of animals, but they are animals. Nidarians, you're probably familiar with. These are um, animals with radial symmetry, so they have a circular pattern. Typically, they live in the water, they're aquatic, and they have stinging cells. Things like jellyfish, hydra, coral. These are animals, they're, they're nidarians, they're called. Worms, there's a few different um, phylum of worms. This is platyhelminthes. These are flat worms. They have bilateral symmetry, two-part symmetry. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. They only have one body opening. So they ingest food through that one body opening and then any waste comes out of that same body opening. Many of these are parasites. So this picture up here, this is a tapeworm. Um, tapeworms live in the digestive tract of different animals. Yeah, What's that? Aren't they yeah, they're not good. Uh, when I was, when I first got, we first got our dog like 20 years ago. She's not alive anymore. But she was one time in the backyard. I got a couple of stories about flatworms. And I took her to go to the bathroom and she went to the bathroom and I looked down at the little uh, present that she left. And on top of that little pile, there's a little white thing, like about the size of a grain of rice. And it was moving around. It was a tapeworm. What happens is every once when a, an animal is infected with tapeworms, every once in a while, a section breaks off and, and comes out in their feces. And so if another dog like from my neighborhood came around and sniffed around where my dog went to the bathroom, um, it could then ingest that tapeworm and then it would be infected. So it, it broke off and it was moving around. So is that like asexual reproduction? Yeah, that's a form of asexual reproduction. Yeah, well. Another tapeworm story. Um, did anyone ever, has anyone ever had a puppy and like they have to be dewormed? Have you ever heard of that term? If you get like a really, really young puppy, Usually before you get it, the breeder or whoever getting it, will, they say it's dewormed. And what that means is they give it a medication because 
Typically in the first few weeks of their life, um, dogs get infected from their, uh, from their parents with uh, worms, parasitic worms. So they give this medication to the dog and it kills the worms. Usually they do it before you get the dog. But our, one of our dogs that we've had, we got her really young, so she hadn't been dewormed yet. So we had to give her the pill. She was a tiny little chihuahua puppy, so she was only about this big. And um, we gave her the deworming pill. And then within 24 hours, she was went outside and she was going to the bathroom. And when she went, it looked like a plate of spaghetti. It was just all worms from her digestive tract. It was really gross. The worms are longer than her. Yeah, it, good way. Mr. Duros? Yeah. You know what like day it is? Of the cycle? Yeah. Do we have you next year? It's day two. No, no, you don't have me. No. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, worms are, tapeworms pretty gross. Are they deadly? They, like Not, they could be deadly. There are some tape, some worms, like um, if you have a dog, you might give it heart guard tablets, like a medicine, because a, a heartworm goes into a dog's heart and it lives there. It lives off their blood. And if they grow too big, they could clog the heart. So they can be deadly, yeah. What about the tapeworm? The tapeworm, not usually. What they do is they absorb nutrients. So like if you if your dog had that, or they affect humans too. Um, what might happen is like even though you're eating enough, you might be really tired and not have energy because actually the worms are absorbing a lot of the nutrients from the foods the dog's eating. Or they might clog the digestive tract so food can't move through it properly. So they could be. Um, more of, the, more of the time they harm the dog's health or the animal. Because most parasites, it's, they don't kill their host, right? Because if a parasite kills its host, then it, it needs another host. So typically parasites have evolved so that they get what they need without actually killing the host. This, is a, uh, this bottom one is called a fluke. It's a flatworm that's not a parasite. They come in all sorts of cool colors. Nemico, this is the heartworm. So the top picture is a dog that died of heartworm. Uh, it's heart. And you could see that stringy stuff is the worm. Is that like multiple or just one? That's probably multiple worms. Yeah, because they reproduce, they can reproduce asexually, so they just build up there. Um, this is just another type of worm. That bottom one. Um, that is a worm called Ascaris, and it's uh, a round worm. It sometimes can be found in like pigs, and it can get into like pork. Uh, and so, if if it were not cooked properly, like the eggs might still be alive, and a person can get infected. It's pretty rare, but that is so. What you see is a bunch of those round worms that are in the um, large intestine of a person and have clogged it and probably they had to have surgery to remove this section of their intestine because this worm was clogging it up. Yeah, it's not pretty. Some of these worms can go into a, a person's brain, lay eggs, and uh, can kill them as well. Are you avoiding looking at the slide, Mary? <laughs> All right. Okay, it's gone. Uh, another type of worm is annelids. These are um, worms you're probably familiar like an earthworm is an annelid. Okay. They're segmented worms. Earthworms are really good for the uh, soil. I don't know, when you were a kid, did anyone ever pick up these little clumps of, of soil that are these little, and then throw them at somebody or crush them in your hands? Not really soil. What those are, are earthworm castings. They're actually earthworm uh, poop. So when you pick up those little clusters of soil, I, everyone's done it, and smush them in your hands, it's really earthworm poop. Um, but they're really good for the soil. They add nutrients. Earthworms help add air to the soil. You can even buy worms like online and put them in your garden. They come in like a bag, you just dump them in your garden to help improve the soil. Leeches, however, are also an example of a segmented worm. Leeches are, are blood-sucking uh, worms. 
they attach to, uh, to the prey. They inject the wound with like a substance that makes it numb so it doesn't hurt. They also in their saliva have a compound that stops the blood from clotting. So they fill up with blood, then they detach and they go and digest that blood. Anybody ever seen the movie Stand By Me? It's an old movie. The boys go swim, they go swimming yeah, in the pond, know. they come out. They have leeches all over them. Yeah, they're finding fresh water and stuff. Mollusks. These are ones you probably are familiar with because you probably eat them or you have eaten them or some people eat them. These are organisms. They have a soft body. Often they have a shell around the outside. They have gills, things like squid, okay, octopus, slugs like we looked at at the beginning of the year, clams, mussels, snails. All of those are um, mollusks. Many of them are filter feeders, the ones that live in the water, like clams. They suck in water, filter out bits of food, and then uh, digest it. Arthropods include insects, arachnids, millipedes, centipedes, crustaceans. Um, arthropods have an exoskeleton. Um, and they are the most diverse group of animals. Like there's more insects than any other uh, group of animals that have been identified. Come in lots of varieties and so forth. Um, so we have up here insects, which have six legs, arachnids with eight, crustaceans with 10, then centipedes and millipedes. Centipedes have one set of legs per, per segment and millipedes have two. I never seen uh, sea urchins, mm -hmm. starfish, um, sand dollars. Those are animals, okay, they're echinoderms. They, um, they produce these spines that you see. Um, some are filter feeders, most of them are filter feeders. Uh, again, they get energy by um, just consuming things out of the water. And then a final group are the chordates. This is where we belong. These are things like vertebrates, okay? They have a dorsal nerve cord, a spinal cord, okay? Um, they include fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, the main groups of vertebrates that we're probably familiar with. So that's our kind of overview of all living groups. Um, as I said, you don't need to worry about tons of the detail here. Just want to connect. So these groups that we just looked at, they all evolved. They all, um, over the last, you know, three and a half billion years, um, evolved to have certain characteristics that made them successful. Some groups were successful and stayed in sort of a similar pattern for a long time. Others evolved more recently. In the order we kind of talked about these animals is pretty much sort of the order that they appeared on earth okay with simple animals first and more complex animals evolving later on and we're going to look at this here in a minute any questions okay i have a question yes what's like so important about why some things have